where we discuss the possibilities. Hi guys, I'm Joe Klimczewski here with Dr. Corey Probst for the Diet Doc Life Mastery Podcast. Today we're back into macro mastery and a very specific topic. Uh, this is one that a listener asked about, Corey, and thought it'd be very good to, to layer in some specificity through the podcast. So this one is on diabetes Great. and everything somebody would need to know. <laughs> what I thought a good approach would be is to explain a little bit about the disease process or condition itself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a lot of experience working with type 1, type 2 diabetics uh, through the last 20, 25 years, but I'm sure you do as well. Um, I, I think there is some really neat new research out there as well that I doubt many people are aware of. So I'll, I'll definitely touch on that. But I think, I think this is going to be an easier topic than people think. So what's, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? If, if a client comes to you and says, I have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, what goes through your mind? I'm thinking, how well is it managed? <laughs> <laughs> what's your experience <laughs> as a diabetic uh, that's the first thing that comes to mind and I want to understand uh, how they're affected by it when did they find out they had it how did they find out they had it um, so it's a matter of kind of his a lot of history gathering for me and then uh, it, for people who come to us who are interested in losing weight it it can feel complicated for people. Um, mm. it, it can feel complex. And so teasing apart how to do what and when and why um, is a process. I see, I see that a lot too with our diet doc mm -hmm. program owners. If they're emailing me for assistance or they're throwing a question out into our, our owner forum, mm -hmm. it typically is kind of that whole like, oh my gosh, somebody has diabetes. What do mm -hmm. I do? Mm -hmm. But I don't think we typically end up being the front line for uh, the, the process itself. Most mm -hmm. people who are diabetics end up going through a hospital system, registered dietitian. Somebody is giving them some assistance. Uh, mm -hmm. The vast majority in our country are going to be type 2 diabetics, something that is an ongoing condition that starts with pre-diabetes and, and you know, maybe lack of management. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do want to I do want to hit on type one diabetics, but we'll save that toward the end uh, when we talk a little bit about the research. But a lot of people do end up coming on board, and it's it's a little bit shocking because the the doctor may not even be able to to get a reading. I've I've seen that before, where they're doing a blood panel, and the doctor said they couldn't even read my blood sugar; it was so high, that out of control. Mm -hmm. That's Pretty extreme, but wow. in our country where obesity is uh, a, a very large factor, that's that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. but here's here's what I would say is is the first thing to consider somebody with diabetes is, as you said, first of all, understand how it is controlled. What medications are they on? If they are a type two diabetic, is it just that they're using a a medication like? Uh, glucophage or something like that are they are they insulin dependent that's a, a big factor um, yeah can I stop you for a second sure <laughs> people might be wondering well what's the difference between pre-diabetes and type 1 and type 2 could we yeah. maybe start there as a foundation and then absolutely I don't get too absolutely. far ahead and then people are feeling like they're in the weeds and all right Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for reining it back in there. Um, if if you're if you're familiar with just getting a blood test, your normal physical blood panel, all of that, comprehensive blood markers, you're going to always see blood sugar is a core component. So uh, most of the time, your doctor wants you in that seventy to ninety range. Uh, I have recently seen some people really low. People who end up with a low body fat or maybe they suffer with hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of our owners presented a client to me just in the last week or two where it was in almost unconscious levels. I mean, this person was waking up in the 20s and 30s. And if you're down below 50, you, you're concerned. So that could be extremely low. That's, that's an issue. You can be too low in blood sugar. So in that 70 to 90 range, you get into 90 to 120 your doctor's going to start getting nervous and they're going to start giving you a lecture about being pre-diabetic. 
Mm. And those are instant blood tests. Uh, you can even do it with a, a glucometer, things like that, that you can get at your, your uh, drugstore. But, and is this uh, fasting, though? Are you talking about a fasting? Right. Reading? Okay. Right. Because right. clearly, if you just had a big meal, your blood sugar mm -hmm. reading is going to be different. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and if you're doing some self-monitoring, you know, those instructions are in that, that kit. But you start getting above that 120, 130, 150, and your doctor's going to put you on a medication. It might start out with something mm -hmm. like, like metformin, glucophage. There are slow and long-term acting medications that are just to control glucose. Mm -hmm. There are so many amazing ways to just just reduce that risk, which which we'll get into. But for the sake of defining, you know, that's kind of the the hypoglycemic or uh, you know normal range all the way up into pre diabetes, and then where you have to start monitoring things. You can be a type two diabetic, which means it's it's not a failure of your pancreas. A type one diabetic is somebody through maybe a virus or a malfunction of the organ. You're just not producing insulin, probably other hormones as well. And so that has to be medicated. Uh, you're going to use insulin. Probably you're going to be on an internal pump. Uh, that is just way more refined and specific, whereas before you would have to give yourself injections in the morning, night, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So type 1 diabetes is a medical condition where you've had a malfunction or disease process within your pancreas and you just don't produce insulin now. Anything that just comes on through your normal behavioral uh, processes and you're, you're just you know, probably going to be somebody who doesn't exercise that much, you're going to be overweight, you're going to have years and years of, of over-consuming calories, mm -hmm. which interestingly, and this is the research I want to get to, uh, we are learning that just, just higher fat, higher saturated fat, uh, has a, a greater impact than carbs. Most of us think, well, it's blood sugar, so it's obviously something to do with how much processed carbohydrate and sugar you consume. That's about the fourth or fifth variable of importance. Mm -hmm. uh, number one is actually just your, your, your health status, you know, how overweight you are, body mass index, that kind of thing. Number two, and hand in hand with that, is your, your exercise level. Because even just a moderate amount of exercise is going to help you dispose of glucose in your bloodstream, not just acutely, but you're going to get better at that over time. Your body adjusts. So two big factors there. And then lastly, as I said, when you get into your actual diet component, high fat, high saturated fat diets actually do more to cause diabetes than just high carbohydrate intake. Mm. So. Like I said, we'll, we'll kind of push that to the side and get into some of that research at the end. Mm -hmm. But those are, those are what I would call the loose definitions from pre-diabetes in the type 2 range to diabetes to the, uh, the type 1. Okay. And what I, would, what I would say, Corey, is, and, and I would love your input too with clients you've worked with, for somebody who comes and they're in that, that middle of the bell curve, they come to our office and they say, well, you know, yes, I've been on these medications for this long. My blood sugar range is here. The average type 2 diabetic can make tremendous inroads into mm -hmm. reducing that, probably coming off of medication. Mm -hmm. So do you have much experience with, with that population? I have had quite a few clients who have been able to get off their medications completely because they've lost a, they've lost body fat and they've increased their exercise significantly yeah and um what's do you have a typical time frame when do you start seeing those changes occur well, I mean, initially what happens is they're able to reduce the amount of medications that they're using, you know, as their bodies are becoming more sensitive to <laughs> insulin because they're exercising, the cells are more sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, I've had clients be able to get off of medications within six months mm -hmm. um, because things happen incredibly quickly as right as the body begins to adapt to more activity and loss of body fat. And so, yeah. So here's, here's some experience I've had and 
it's it's just quite profound, more than you would think. I, I remember going on a trip with my father before he passed away, and he was a type two diabetic, uh, very sedentary. But on this particular trip, we were doing a decent amount of walking, mm -hmm. and so even a guy on a cane who had to sit down about every twenty feet, uh, he would he would check his blood sugar every morning. You know, doctor's orders. He had whatever array of medication he needed, and he knew how to adjust that. And every single day on this trip, when he would check his blood sugar in the morning, it was almost half of what it was the day before. And I mean, you're talking about going from like 800 to 400 to 200 to 150. I mean, in just a matter of a week or week and a half of just walking, and eating a more moderate diet, <laughs> I mean, you saw somebody on medication drop that level like that. Now, now think if uh, you know somebody has been in this process for even a short amount of time, mm -hmm. and they reverse out of that. How much mm -hmm. impact that has on their long-term health? Oh my goodness! Yes. Yeah. I, I I even remember one of one of the first diabetics I ever worked with. This goes back almost two decades. Uh, was a type one diabetic. And so that kind of scared me at the time. I didn't have a lot of experience with that, mm -hmm. but be, you know, simply because he had to take insulin to live. And this was before mm -hmm. pumps were, were the norm. And so he had to give himself injections of insulin. He had to monitor blood sugar. And you know, if blood sugar goes too low, I mean, that's, it, that can be a lethal problem yeah. for a diabetic. So here was a guy who worked with me for three or four months minimum and I saw him bring down the amount of insulin he was having to inject by 500%. I remember he, you know, it was measured by units, like he was taking five units a day, and he came all the way down to a, a literal 500% decrease just because he had lost 30 or 40 pounds, he was exercising more, eating better, mm -hmm. and that's a type one diabetic mm -hmm. where your body's not producing any. Mm -hmm. So if you're a type two, you know, think of how much you can do just in terms of becoming um, more resilient to those changes. Your, your blood sugar, as I said, is being disposed of acutely much, much more rapidly. Yeah. So I'm interested too, let, let, let's say that you're sitting down with a client and this person mm -hmm. is presenting you with the average, you know, type two story. My A1C level is here. Mm -hmm. I'm taking these medications. What do you tell them to watch for? How are, how are you having them help you manage or moderate this? I think we as nutrition clinicians need to be careful in terms of what we're advising and asking them to do. And I will always defer to their physicians first. But I want to have a good understanding of what their physical experience is. Um, their energy levels, um, when, when they're exercising, for example, uh, you know, are they experiencing, or just throughout the day, are they experiencing any shaking, shakiness or lightheadedness? Um, things like that are going to be really important to me. You know, a lot of the symptoms that non-diabetics experience when they're not managing their <laughs> nutrition appropriately are the same things I'm going to be asking about and looking for with my diabetic clients. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree, you know, first of all, I think it's very important because I know a lot of nutrition coaches and consultants watch our podcast or listen. Yeah. And, and of course, this is a medical issue. If somebody's on any kind of medication, they're dealing with a, a health or medical condition or disease process, that is absolutely something we would tell our diet doc program owners you know, this is not something that you're wading into the middle of and claiming to be able to assist and we're going to get you off of all your medications and all that. Mm -hmm. I also instantly say, look, you need to tell your doctor what you're doing. You mm -hmm. are engaged in a weight loss program. You're going to start working on your health and your fitness and make them aware so that they can be checking in with you and they might have a different protocol. You might have some of those medications they want to adjust immediately mm -hmm. uh, because it, it's almost like somebody who has low or has high blood pressure and they're mm -hmm. on a blood pressure lowering medication. That person starts losing weight, getting healthier. The same dose of medication could you know, make them pass out just getting up out of a chair. So the same thing can be happening where you could be over-medicating with diabetes and all of a sudden your blood sugar is plummeting. 
So absolutely something to monitor more closely than ever. Make sure your physician is aware that you're doing that. And then uh, I'm glad you brought up the point that even a non-diabetic can experience some of these same symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Because as we all start eating better, exercising more, increasing the intensity of our training, you might feel some of those fluctuations, but a lot of that will adjust out as your body becomes more adapted to that. It's one of the reasons why even people are in the intermittent fasting kind of world right now, and, and they feel like after a while, I actually like this better. You know, I, I never thought I could go eight hours without a meal or 16 hours without a meal, but once you become adapted to that, your body is just better at using different substrates of energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, the other thing that I'm doing with them is I'm, of course, I'm assessing how they're eating and what they're eating and what times they're eating and when they're eating, how much they're actually consuming. Um, Cause that's going to affect how much medication they're using and mm -hmm. uh, you know, how they're feeling in the moment. I remember when we were giving a lecture years ago, I was still in Evansville and we were at the library and there were a lot of diabetics in the audience um, and they were talking about what they learned through the, the hospital program as, you know, the diabetes education program and uh, what they were told and how they were told to consume food, what would be an appropriate level of carbohydrates was the main thing that this food plan was focused on. And, uh, you know, when they said what they were eating, we both kind of looked at each other like, okay, <laughs> I think we'd make some changes to that. <laughs> but again, it, it really does come down to a very, it's an individual process and, and experience. And so we have to treat it that way for, for each person. Right. Metabolism comes into play, body type, activity mm -hmm. level. You know, what, what most registered dietitians are taught, if you look at standard textbooks, is, is you know, first of all, a, a calorie need, a basal metabolic rate that just may be too standardized, too mm -hmm. inflated for you know the top people. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very common to hear somebody come from a hospital system and they say, well, I'm supposed to eat 45 grams of carbs, uh, you know, mm -hmm. breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then 15 grams of carbs for snacks a couple times a day. Mm -hmm. And you might look at that and say, well, you know, that's getting close to maybe 200 grams of carbs for, you know, a person who's 59 years old and all of that. And yeah. you may or may not agree with that. That might be too much. But in terms of looking at, you know, maybe elevating somebody's protein to 1.5 or two times the RDA, which is absolutely researched as not just safe, but the new standard for, mm -hmm. Um, you know, thriving nutritionally, mm -hmm. allowing somebody's fat intake to stay low enough because again, fat has more, saturated fat has more to do with diabetes than even sugar sometimes, but you still want to have enough allowance for, you know, practicality and foods people like. So that's where those recommendations for carbs might need to come down a bit. Mm -hmm. But as a team player, with a person who might be under the care of a physician as well as a, you know, registered dietitian. Those are things that you can, you know, look at and analyze, but at the, at the same time, it's going to come down to that person's overall result. Are they losing slow enough and fast enough? You know, maybe because of their condition, they should only lose a half a pound a week. Maybe, maybe one pound would be too aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, it really just depends on, on them. So Joe, what would you say to someone who comes in and is like, you know, I just, I can't maintain my weight. Weight loss can't happen for me because I have diabetes. And so what are we going to do? Well, there is, it's an interesting nuance in that insulin, when you are supplementing insulin or even an insulin mimicking medication, you know, that is increasing storage, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where these balances come into play. I, I had a question from one of our program owners, a type one diabetic who's actually on the younger athletic side and kind of ectomorphic. Mm -hmm. So this particular gentleman, his goal is to gain muscle mm -hmm. 
and he's already eating about 4,000 calories a day. So as a type one diabetic, yeah. his protein's over 200 grams a day. He's already eating, you know, 350, 450 grams of carbs a day. Fat intake is over 100 grams a day. And yet he still wants to gain. Mm -hmm. And my first question to our clinician was, you know, it, uh, tell me about his insulin use because perhaps mm -hmm. he just needs a little more insulin so he's actually better at storing energy, yeah. which would be the opposite of what our goal is for most people. Mm -hmm. So between those two extremes, you really have to have some close monitoring. And I, I will say this, I have worked with diabetics, even type ones, who have gotten down to a low level of body fat. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that. Uh, you know, it's dangerous, but you know, take somebody who wants to get a, this, a female who wants to get down to seven or eight percent body fat for her own just appearance or, or competition goals. You are threading a needle on how much insulin are you using to be healthy and safe and not going so low that your, your blood sugar is, is taking a dump. So you really have to be committed to, you know, self-assessment, even just reading those subjective symptoms. So this is why, again, your own client education really has to be strong, you know, in mm -hmm. how we prepare them for those changes they might, might experience. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about a client I have right now who is over 300 pounds, is mm -hmm. a type 2 diabetic, uh, and binge eats. And just the level of blood sugar volatility that occurs because of that, I guess we could call it a structure style of eating. Um, and it's, it's, un, it's, it's unhealthy and it's scary uh, as a clinician and for the person himself uh, I know he's, this person's not comfortable in any way and feels a bit out of control, but can you talk a little bit about the effects of that sort of nutritional structure and just how binge eating can, can affect someone's blood sugar control when you're type two? Yeah, what, what, a, what a great way to, to wrap up this segment because I, I, I would not have even considered going here in this conversation, but mm -hmm. Just because you have a medical condition like this doesn't mean it's easy to manage. Yeah. Uh, you, you might think, well, they have that, so they have to eat well. You know, they have to manage that like any other medical condition we might have. That person has the same kind of cravings and food yeah. preferences and desires as anybody else. So it might seem ridiculous to us to see somebody with diabetes eating an ice cream cone. Like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Um, human beings. Yeah. At, yeah. At the same time, if they are monitoring their level of intake, you can certainly make allowances for that. And that mm -hmm. could be your carb intake and, you know, fat intake for that meal. You can, you can do that in moderation, but absolutely you're playing with some long-term health consequences, you know, with higher blood sugar, blood sugar is very corrosive. This is the, the end game of diabetes in that when that excess blood sugar circulating through your body, you end up deteriorating the smallest, most sensitive uh, blood vessels. You know, that's why diabetics often end up going blind and having Fingers, kidney so. failure. Absolutely. You know, their, their most distal areas, you're saying, you know, ulcers in their feet and legs and all of that, that end up, you know, just moving amputations higher and higher and higher. So circulation, all of those things are so critical. Mm -hmm. uh, that even though you might think that you can't live a normal life and enjoy those foods, absolutely not true with good self-care, uh, you know, moderation, education, self-monitoring. But I would, I would end like this. Mm -hmm. In these priorities, this is what you have to do as a diabetic, whether you're type 1 or type 2, is commit to being as active as you can be. You've, you have to get through glucose disposal processes all day long, act, not all day long. I mean, you have to run a marathon every day, <laughs> but you have to be active. You just cannot be, <laughs> yeah. you gotta be, it's got to be something you are consistently doing as part of your weekly exercise. It's intentional. You're doing it. Uh, you have to be looking at overall food intake. You know, what is your calorie intake? What is your body mass doing? Are you reducing body fat? Are you in a healthy zone? So exercise, body composition, 
and then your macronutrient profile. Mm -hmm. Are you are you making sure that your saturated fat is low enough? Are you making sure that a larger portion of your carbohydrates are whole food and complex sources? And then you know the the final tip of the iceberg is just monitoring carefully enough. You know, even over time, you know, chart some of this stuff out on a spreadsheet so you can see over time, is my blood sugar changing? Um, you know, do I need to make a, a, a nuanced change in my medication? You know, let my doctor know, change mm -hmm. food sources. Of course, you're going to be monitored probably through A1C testing in your physician. But all of that has to come down to you making that comprehensive plan. Joe, what I love about what you just said is that everything except the blood sugar monitoring in a formal way piece is what we would recommend that every single person on the planet do to be yeah. their healthiest, best self. Absolutely. And by doing those things, we can actually prevent people from acquiring at least type two or becoming even pre-diabetic. So thank you for that very clear explanation. I think that was super helpful.